Welcome to A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We would love for you to join in our conversation. Simply follow us on our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you have a question, email or text us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Now here's your host, pastor, author, and Bible teacher, Scott Richards, along with his right-hand man, Sean Richards. Well, a very good afternoon to you. As you can see, I am by my lonesome here today, my right-hand man, protege, all-around good guy, Sean Richards, feeling a little under the weather, but we are delighted to be able to be with you to share uh, the Word of God with you. Uh, What a wonderful blessing it is that each and every day at this time, we can join with you and uh, share in God's inspired Word. Hey, uh, feel free to join on in. Just uh, get in touch with us uh, by uh, way of the internet. If you are on Facebook, we would welcome you to be a part of the broadcast. Uh, it's uh, just such a blessing to see so many people taking advantage of uh, our internet connections. Uh, by way of Facebook, we're available for you on Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you go there, you'll see my smiling face waiting there for you, and uh, you can click on our comment corner and get your questions to us in real time. If uh, you are watching uh, this broadcast or listening to it by way of radio and would like to get a question to us by way of phone, you can do that as well. Our toll-free number is 1-877-556-1212, 1-877-556-1212, and uh, we'll be uh, more than happy to tackle your questions as uh, you give us the opportunity uh, to do so. Uh, If uh, you would like to email us a question, you can do that as well. Our email address is questionsforhope at gmail.com, questionsforhope at gmail.com, and uh, through that uh, particular venue, we'll be able to answer your questions as you send them along. Uh, Again, if uh, you would uh, like to uh, be involved with our conversation, as always, our questions are uh, pretty much uh, up to you. Uh, it, uh, just one uh, caveat, just make sure it's a sincere question. And if you're looking for an answer straight from the Scripture, feel free to be a part of the broadcast today. Again, uh, on Facebook, uh, click on our comment corner, let us know that you're there, and get your questions to us, and we will be uh, more than happy to answer any questions on your heart or on your mind. Uh, What a blessing it is uh, each and every day to be able to join together and explore God's Word together. So uh, feel free to join on in. We're looking forward to hearing from you on the broadcast today. Hey, uh, kicking off the broadcast, interesting question uh, sent along to us uh, prior to airtime from DJ. Uh, DJ uh, writes to us, "Uh, Dear Pastor Scott and Sean, is a Bible teacher's job to feed the poor or as we as Christians as a whole supposed to do that? Well, DJ, that's a great question because on uh, the one side of the a coin, uh, a pastor has to be uh, pretty selective, if you will, uh, about the uh, kind of uh, time investments that they make. And, and it's not a uh, new issue. As a matter of fact, uh, back in Acts chapter 6, you talk about feeding the poor or taking care of them. Uh, We are told that in those days when the numbers of disciples were multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Uh, The Hebrews were the widows who spoke uh, Jewish. uh, They spoke Hebrew. They were from a Jewish background and culture. Uh, The Hellenists were those that were part uh, were influenced by Greek culture and thought. So uh, again, they felt like uh, these Hellenists were getting this short shift on uh, terms of uh, the daily food distribution. They were told, the 12 summoned the, num- summoned the number of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of God's word. Well, there you see, uh, DJ, that uh, the number one uh, investment that a pastor can make is this. You know, you can try to get involved with an awful lot of different things, but uh, you can end up uh, spread a mile wide and six inches deep. A pastor's number one uh, priority should be uh, studying and sharing God's word and praying for people, being available to love people in that capacity. Uh, And this is really, uh, DJ, where discipleship comes in. Any ministry, uh, according to Ephesians chapter 4, should be all about the business of equipping the saints 
for the work of ministry. In other words, ministry shouldn't just be uh, a one-man band. It shouldn't be something that uh, we are just uh, allowing one person to do everything all at once. Sometimes all of that gets dumped on a pastor. And I'll tell you what, that's a great recipe for burnout because, you know, we're all given different spiritual gifts. uh, And uh, because we have these different spiritual gifts, uh, some of us don't have others that, that others have. And when we try to take on things that God has not equipped us to do, well, that's going to end up uh, being a work of the flesh. It's going to end up being frustrating. And so it's very, very important for us to understand what God has and hasn't called us to do. But as we invest in the lives of people, as we build into them uh, the, the truth uh, of God and, and allow them to be able to see, not just by explanation and exhortation by example, what it means to walk with the Lord, then other people with spiritual gifts, maybe gifts of mercy and helps and administration can come along and help meet the needs of people that are, are hungry and in need of food as far as the function of the church is concerned. Now, beyond all of that, uh, as far as uh, helping feed the hungry and so on, one of the things that you know I make it a practice to do when I'm driving around town is to have a uh, package put together uh, for the homeless people that you encounter on different uh, street corners and such. I never give money to homeless people for this reason. Uh, I've been told, especially by those who are involved uh, in uh, ministering to the homeless, that if you give uh, a homeless person money, you might as well just go down to the crack house and buy them drugs and hand it to them. You might as well go to the uh, liquor store and get them a, a bottle of booze because that's what they're going to use it for. But if you can give them something tangible, and what I try to do is I get one of those big plastic bags and I put in it a pair of socks, I put in a bottle of water, I put it in an energy, a protein bar uh, in it. And I also put uh, information on the gospel rescue mission in there and uh, a uh, a brief uh, presentation of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so when I see people along that line, um, you know, I feel like we're all called to make a difference no matter what function we have within the church. But as far as what we do in the church, uh, one of the most important things we can do is build into the hearts and lives of others. Second Timothy chapter two, verses one through two gives us the model for that. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace which is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you've heard from me and the presence of many witnesses, these uh, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So you see that uh, the Christian life is a relay race. We receive good things from God. We share them with others who are able to teach others who are then able to teach others as well. And as we are a part of this discipling model, raising up more and more people, then the needs of the body get met in a a wonderful and a pervasive way. So, DJ, thank you so much for sending that question along. Hey, before uh, we go any deeper, I want to uh, open up uh, the broadcast in a word of prayer. I want to remember my right-hand man, protege, all-around good guy, Sean, who's a little under the weather here today, and as well, anything that's going on in your heart and your life out there. Let's dedicate this time to the Lord. Father, I thank you that we have this opportunity to invite you to be part of the broadcast today. And what a blessing it's been all week long to tackle such wonderful issues and to explore your truth in such beautiful ways. I pray, Father, that the direction of this broadcast and uh, the way that it flows would be entirely according to your hands and according to your will. I pray that the people all over the world uh, that might be accessing this broadcast today would be built up and edified and encouraged in their walk with you. Thank you that we can give this broadcast to you. May, may you be glorified, Lord. May your word find fertile soil within the hearts of people, and maybe even, Lord, those on the outside looking in at a real relationship with you. May they come to know you as their personal Savior. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you uh, so much for being a part of the broadcast today. A number of people uh, checking in on the broadcast today. I got a question from John about an issue that we uh, dealt with uh, a little bit earlier, uh, a little bit uh, in a a different way. Uh, John, thanks so much for sending that question along. Uh, The question came up uh, earlier today. Uh, There was a big uh, dust up, if you will, uh, from uh, Franklin Graham commenting on another dust up that was created uh, by uh, the uh, folks that are running Christianity Today. Now, if you're familiar with Christianity Today, 
uh, you know that uh, there is uh, uh, you know, a, a real sea change that has gone on there. Christianity Today was originally founded by uh, the Billy Graham organization with an idea of being able to share about the, uh, the issues of today and so on. Uh, but uh, Christianity Today released an editorial uh, coming out in favor of the impeachment of Donald Trump. Well, Franklin Graham uh, responded on Facebook and other social media to this uh, particular uh, article. He said this, Christianity Today released an editorial stating that President Trump should be removed from office and they invoked my father's name, I suppose, to try to bring legitimacy to their statements. So I feel it's important for me to respond. Yes, my father, Billy Graham, founded Christianity Today, but no, he would not agree with their opinion piece. In fact, he would have been very disappointed. I have not previously shared who my father voted for in the past election, but because of the article, I feel it's necessary to share it now. My father knew Donald Trump, he believed in Donald Trump, and he voted for Donald Trump. He believed that Donald J. Trump was the man for this hour uh, in the history for our nation. For Christianity Today to side with the Democratic Party in a totally partisan attack on the President of the United States is unfathomable. Christianity Today failed to acknowledge that not uh, one single Republican voted with the Democrats to impeach the president. I know a number of Republicans in Congress, and many of them are strong Christians. If the president were guilty of what the Democrats claimed, these Republicans would have joined him with the Democrats to impeach him. But the Democrats were not even unanimous. Two voted against impeachment and one voted present. This impeachment was politically motivated, 100% partisan. Why would Christianity Today choose to side uh, with a Democratic left whose only goal is to discredit and smear the name of a sitting president. They want readers to believe the Democratic leadership rather than believe the President of the United States. Look at all the President has accomplished in a very short time. The economy of our nation is the strongest it's been in 50 years. ISIS and the Caliphate have been defeated. The President has renegotiated trade deals to benefit all Americans. The list of accomplishments is long, but as for me as a Christian, the fact that he is the most pro-life President in modern history is extremely important. And Christianity Today wants us to ignore that, to say it doesn't count. The president has been a staunch defender of religious freedom at home and around the world, and Christianity Today wants us to ignore that. Also, the president has appointed conservative judges in record number, and Christianity Today wants us to ignore that. Christianity Today feels he should be removed from office because of false accusations the president emphatically denies. Christianity Today said it's time to call a spade a spade. The spade is this. Christianity Today has been used by the left for their political agenda. It's, obviously, it's obvious that Christianity Today has moved to the left and is representing the elitist liberal wing of evangelicalism. Is President Trump guilty of sin? Of course he is, as we're all past presidents, and as each and every one of us are, including myself. Therefore, let's pray for the president as he continues to lead the affairs of our nation. Well, um, you know, it's interesting, some of the comments uh, that were raised along this line, people asked me earlier what my take was on this particular issue. Well, uh, again, <clears throat> so important for us uh, to understand uh, that from my point of view, and it's not original with me, uh, one of the saddest things that, uh, that people can do uh, in terms of uh, really in a sense, minimizing our effectiveness in this world is to set aside what uh, the Lord would desire to do within our lives for something less. And this is what I mean. Uh, I posted this on Facebook earlier, but I'll repeat it for you now. Uh, you know, again, uh, Christianity Today's fatal flaw in all of this, in my opinion, is not as it doesn't have anything to do with politics or who they side with or uh, what you feel about Donald Trump's uh, worthiness of impeachment and so on. I mean, these are separate conversations that sincere Christians can disagree on. But the fatal flaw that I see in all of this is that Christianity Today, which was founded by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Organization, has abandoned the mission of evangelism to vent on a political conflict. And this is what I mean by this. Half of the country is going to agree with them and half is going to disagree, uh, you know, generously speaking here. But if you're part of the group that, uh, that doesn't agree uh, with uh, what Christianity Today has put forward, uh, understand this. Uh, the half that do agree 
uh, with, uh, say, keeping Donald Trump uh, as president and not supporting this impeachment are never going to listen to you ever again about anything you have to say about the gospel because you've alienated them on what I consider to be a side issue, a non-essential issue as far as those who purport to be about the business of reaching people for Christ is concerned. Should Christians have their political uh, opinions? Well, I think that we as Christians should take a stand on the moral and spiritual issues of today. We live in a representative uh, form of government, and because of that, according to Romans chapter 13, we should be good citizens of this republic and vote our consciences in uh, elections to support those who will stand for biblical standards and uh, to not vote for those who do not. But the important thing for us to understand in this set of circumstances is that Christianity today, in a sense, has cashed in their credibility and their objectivity to virtue signal to a particular side of this very divisive issue, to a particular political uh, constituency. Uh, Billy Graham, who is the founder of Christianity Today was able to minister to people of all political stripes. Uh, you look down uh, through the years and presidents from both sides of the aisle all look to him for uh, insight and guidance on the issues of the day. And he was able to do so because he didn't represent the parties of men, but the kingdom of God. And I think that's the most important issue here. Uh, Billy Graham impacted the entire world uh, because he completed, he continually repeated uh, over and over again something he was known for. He said, the Bible says. And I think that's what we've really got to get back to in all of this. You know, when people will ask me the question, you know, Pastor Scott, are you a Republican or a Democrat? I sometimes surprise people by saying, I'm neither. And they go, well, what do you mean by that? I tell them, you know, I am a monarchist because I serve a great king. And, and this is what I mean by that. The great king, our Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't want us to sell out our spiritual birthright for a mess of political pottage, whatever side of the aisle you're on. Unfortunately, in my opinion, Christianity Today, like a lot of uh, quote-unquote Christian organizations, will uh, eventually do that. I mean, to take a note from Billy's book, what does the Bible say about where we should stand on political issues? Well, I think it comes back to Hebrews, or I should say Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly await a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. My citizenship's in heaven. I want to be a good citizen here in this world, but when push comes to shove, the most important thing that I can do is to be a representative. Uh, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, the Apostle Paul made a very interesting uh, statement about the function that he felt that he had within this world. He said this in verse 20, Now then, as ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I love the fact that Paul emphasizes that we are ambassadors uh, for God. Now, an ambassador, when he represents uh, our country in a foreign land, doesn't represent his own takes, his own point of view. He has to represent, without fault or failure, the interests of the ones who sent him to be an ambassador. And I think if we do that as believers, we're going to be very uh, well served uh, during this time of incredible division in our culture. You know, uh, when we, we see, say, the other side of the equation, whatever the other side is to you, say, pushing hard or calling names or, or misrepresenting things or saying things that are false or, or aren't true, boy, the biggest temptation I have is to jump in and give my two cents worth. But the minute I do that, understand something. When I stand up and share God's word on a Sunday morning, I have to realize that represented within my body are people of all different political stripes or none at all. They don't come to church to find out where I stand on politics. They come to church because I as a pastor believe that it is my job to share without uh, fear or failure uh, what God's Word has to say. And if I teach through the Bible chapter by chapter, book by book, and verse by verse, there are going to be times 
where application points are going to come up that absolutely do deal with the issues of the day. And uh, as these issues do come up, as, as we deal with the issues of the day, people are going to find how to apply their Christian uh, convictions to uh, the, the very difficult issues that we face. Uh, you know, for instance, you know, I tell people that I feel that there are two non-negotiables that inform uh, every uh, decision that I make as far as voting. Number one, what is that uh, pol- politicians stand on the subject of abortion, on the uh, pro-life issue. If they are not pro-life, if they will not stand for the least and the most helpless in our society uh, in a life and death manner, I can't support them. Uh, biblically, I don't feel there's any wiggle room there. The other issue that I need to know about a particular politician is where do they stand in terms of how they support Israel in our culture, uh, in our, our uh, government's dealings. And uh, if uh, they are uh, anti-Israel, they want to disengage from Israel, they don't want to support Israel any longer, I can't support them either at that particular point. And so it's very important for us to understand Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. God promised Abraham he'd bless those who bless them and curse those who curse him. So I can't take a stand outside of those particular parameters. So uh, all things considered, long story short, uh, it's so important for us to grasp this, uh, this uh, particular uh, issue that we have going on in our society and our culture today. Let's make sure that we represent our, our good and awesome King, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's make sure that we are seizing every opportunity to be able to share the gospel and not get hooked in uh, to these uh, particular, uh, you know, Donny Brooks and dust ups that come along the way, whatever side you want to uh, err upon. So, uh, if we can preserve our credibility and our integrity to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ, well, then I think we're going to find ourselves in a very good place. So, uh, hopefully, uh, that uh, that uh, covers that particular issue. Uh, you know, again. Uh, the idea of uh, impeachment and where we are in our politics from a prophetic point of view, that's another question that we got here on the comment corner, uh, doesn't have any kind of prophetic impact. Well, it very well could. You know, one, another question that gets asked us quite a bit on uh, the broadcast uh, is this, where is the United States in biblical prophecy? And uh, the, uh, the simple answer to that question is, is we're really nowhere to be found. Now, some people will try to theorize, you know, based upon, like, say, Isaiah 19 about a land that rivers divide, but it's very clear that that passage is talking about Ethiopia in in context here. It doesn't relate to the United States. Uh, Some people have uh, written books that really take radically out of context uh, certain statements were made about God's dealing with northern Israel uh, and uh, try to wedge it into 9-11. And I, I think these are things that we should probably stay away from spiritually. Some people will say that the United States is Mystery Babylon, but it certainly seems in the scripture it goes beyond the United States. Uh, we're absolutely absent in terms of uh, being a major player in end times prophecy. So where is the United States? Where did we go? Well, there's uh, a few possible answers to that question. Uh, One of the reasons that the United States may not be being mentioned in biblical prophecy uh, may come down to uh, something that our good friend uh, Joel Rosenberg uh, put forth in one of his political thrillers, that uh, the United States gets involved in some kind of limited war, and as a result, we're devastated, and into this power vacuum, uh, the Antichrist rises. That's very possible. I hope it doesn't happen, but it's a possibility in this crazy world that we live in. The other possibility is this. Uh, Dominant world powers have a way of rising, having their moment in the sun, and then passing by the scene. And I believe the United States is no exception to that rule. Uh, You know, for instance, if uh, we would go back a hundred years or so at this time, back to the, uh, say, turn of the century, the number one dominant power in the world was Great Britain. The sun never set on the British Empire because uh, Britain uh, ruled the seas. It was the 800-pound military and economic guerrilla. But after World Wars I and II, uh, Britain faded from the scene, and the United States began to assert its dominance, especially during the Cold War era and especially afterwards. Right now, we're kind of the economic straw that stirs the drink. But the United States, well, 
is going through what a lot of dominant world powers go through. Uh, oftentimes, they don't fall from the outside because of war, but they tend to collapse from the inside because they simply lose either the will uh, to exercise their military dominance or because uh, economics start to come into play or because they become more interested in uh, social issues that are going on rather than maintaining their world dominance. And, you know, we, we hear uh, foreshadowings of all of this, you know, the rise of uh, kind of a nationalistic uh, fervor where we say to ourselves, okay, why are we the world's policemen? You know, why do we have to uh, send our sons and daughters to die overseas for these conflicts that really don't apply to us directly? And, and there's a growing sense of uh, movement in that uh, particular direction. The United States morally, I think, is moving away uh, from uh, the kind of moral fiber that would allow us to be a leader within the world. And it's very possible that like Britain, you know, losing the uh, starch, if you will, the stomach to stand up and occupy that role, the United States might fall by the wayside. We might just uh, continue to decline until we're no longer a major player and then someone else is going to have to step up. But the most encouraging possibility for why the United States isn't mentioned in biblical prophecy, and this I think gets to your question, John, uh, is this. It's entirely possible that when the rapture happens, the United States, more than any other nation on earth, is going to be affected. You know, according to the Barna Organization, a recent survey I saw stated that there were well over 50 million professing evangelical Christians in the United States. Well, say Barna's statistics are half right. Say there's 25 million sincere, genuine believers in Jesus Christ here in this country right now. Well, uh, imagine what would happen if the rapture took place. Suddenly, 25 million people have vanished. Boy, you hearken back to 9-11. Remember what happened then. 3,000 people lost their lives that day, and it took our economy about three years to recover. Could you imagine what would happen if suddenly 25 million people, uh, 25 million credit cards that aren't being paid, 25 million mortgages that go into default, 25 million uh, key individuals in uh, offices of government or the military or, or, or leadership in, in communities and so forth, suddenly gone. What would that do to the United States? Well, it would absolutely devastate us. Now, in comparison, uh, Western Europe, would see kind of a dent, uh, sort of a nudge as a result of the rapture happening, but certainly not on the degree of the United States. Uh, Other major world powers, China would probably see a large portion of their population uh, suddenly gone, but because it's a communist government, they'd probably welcome it. They wouldn't miss a beat. So uh, because the United States, I think uniquely, has this uh, population of born-again believing Christians, when the rapture happens, Uh, I think uh, the United States is going to be absolutely gutted, and into that vacuum, the Antichrist is going to rise. And the reason that I think it's a good thing to take that particular position is this. I think it's one of the most spiritually practical positions that we can occupy. Why is that? Because if I believe that, well, then I am going to do everything that I can to make sure that that happens. And the best way I can make sure that happens, and it dovetails very nicely into what I think the fatal flaw of Christianity today is, is this. I'm going to be about the business of trying to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to as many people as I possibly can, uh, knowing that the time is getting late. The fact that Israel is back in the land, the fact that we see, uh, for instance, alliances like Russia and Iran uh, that never existed uh, in previous history, now becoming a fact of life. Uh, the fact that uh, we, we see uh, so much of the moral decline and the spiritual decline that the Bible forecasts, and even among the church, uh, I think uh, we are definitely given a lot of heavenly heads ups, a lot of taps on the shoulder, that certainly the time of Jesus' return is nearer now than we first believed. And if we really believe that, then the most important thing is not to go all chicken little on something and run around yelling the sky is falling, but praying every day and seizing the opportunity to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ and what it means to have a saving relationship with him with as many people as we possibly can. And so if you're watching this broadcast and you're on the outside in looking uh, at a relationship with Christ, how do I become a Christian? How do I make sure my sins are forgiven? How do make, can I make sure that uh, I'm going to be a possessor of eternal life? 
Well, the Bible makes it very, very simple. The Bible tells us some facts. The first reason that we feel alienated from God is because the Bible says we are. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the good news is God loves us, and he provided a way for our sins to be forgiven, us to be reconciled with him. John 3.16 puts it so succinctly, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wow. What an amazing blessing to know that we are given that opportunity to have everlasting life. So all we have to do is put our faith and trust in Christ. The Bible says you can do that by calling on the name of the Lord. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It even tells us in Romans 10 who were to confess that to. It says that whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. We confess that to God through the avenue of prayer. So if you'd like to pray and receive Christ as your Savior, I'd like to give you the opportunity to do so right now. It's not the prayer that matters. It's the attitude of your heart. But the Bible says if you're not comfortable praying, you don't know how to pray, you can pray along with me right now. Let's let's pray together here. Lord, I know I need you. I know my sins have separated me from you. But I believe that Jesus died for me and rose from the dead so that I could have life. Thank you for forgiving me, Lord. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to put my faith and trust in you. Please, Lord, come into my heart. Forgive my sins. Make me a brand new person. I believe you died for me, so I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer in the sincerity of your heart, welcome to the family of God. And if uh, you did pray, we'd like to get you a package of information that can help you get growing in your new walk with God. Just uh, contact us by way of uh, the internet or by email at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Give us your contact information and we'll get you our new believer survival package and get you up, going, and growing in your walk with God. Uh, Praise God and thanks so much for being a part of the broadcast today. I got a question from Steve. Uh, He said, I'm still waiting for an answer to a question I asked you a number of months ago. What happened that you abandoned it? Uh, Steve, uh, if you would like to uh, reiterate that question on our comment corner, we'll be more than happy to answer it here on the broadcast today. So uh, any questions that you have, feel free to send them along to us on our comment corner on Facebook, or you can call our toll-free number 1-877-556-1212 and uh, send your questions along and we'll get them on our Google uh, phone device Uh, just uh, when they ask you who you want to leave the message for just say a reason for hope and then you can leave that question for us to be answered on the broadcast today. Uh, Another question uh, we we, uh, received uh, prior to airtime I think is a real question they asked for their name not to be used but uh, I think it's a very good question what advice will you recommend for someone who's going through a season of temptation in their Christian life apart from accountability and prayer? Well, I'd say accountability and prayer are two really great avenues that we can have within our walk with God. Uh, In the book of James, uh, we are told, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The fervent effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. Well, if uh, we don't have that connection with other people, where we can confess our sins to one another, where we can pray for one another as far as our shortcomings go, where we can have that accountability to be able to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Uh, You know, Christianity was never intended to be a lone ranger operation. We need each other. We need to build each other up in the body of Christ. And so accountability, I think, is key. Prayer, boy, having people pray for you if you're going through a struggling time, more things are accomplished through prayer than we can ever imagine. But uh, the one aspect, I think, of uh, going through a season of temptation uh, that we don't see uh, listed here uh, is, is really, really key. And that is the filling and empowering work of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Galatians, chapter 5, we're told uh, a very interesting take on the reality of our walk with Christ. In verse 16, we read, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit 
against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, I love this because we're told a few things. First of all, we are told that we can walk in the Spirit and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The need to walk in the Spirit is key because in any given circumstance, in any given situation that we find ourselves in, uh, we're going to do one thing or the other as believers in Christ. We're either going to be led by the Spirit or we're going to fall back into the old patterns of the flesh, our fallen nature. That can happen to us at any time. Uh, I love the fact that if we walk in the Spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, it means to daily and even moment by moment, challenge by challenge, ask the Lord for the resource of the filling and enabling power of His Spirit to live the kind of life that God, that pleases God. You see, the Christian life is something we live for God. And if we fall into that trap, like, oh boy, I got to white knuckle it. And oh, if I don't do this for God, he's really going to be uh, upset with me. Well, let me tell you something. That is not going to get us very far in our walk with the Lord. Uh, the Christian life isn't something we do for God. Rather, it's something that God does through us. In the book of Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, the Apostle Paul says, For I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died needlessly. You know, in other words, if we could live a righteous life through our own power and our own strength, there was no need for Jesus to die in the first place. But even after receiving a saving relationship with God, we have to continually rely on the power and filling of God's Spirit if we're going to uh, get anywhere in our walk with the Lord. That's why Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 says, uh, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled, that is, be constantly being filled, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's what the language indicates in the original. Uh, some people will say, well, Scott, do you believe in a second experience with the Holy Spirit after salvation? Yeah, after the Lord indwells you. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said to his disciples, uh, again, uh, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. I love that because when the Holy Spirit's power comes upon me, he gives me the power to be a witness. That is exhibit A of what God can do in a life. Now, how do we get that power of the Holy Spirit? It's simply by asking in faith. In the book of Luke chapter 11 and verse 11, Jesus said this, You are fathers. If you have a child who asks you for a loaf of bread, will you give him a stone? If he asks you for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If he asks you for water, will you give him a poisonous serpent? I tell you, no. And if you, being evil, know how to give your children good gifts, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for him? Well, I love that because uh, what the scripture is telling us in that, uh, that particular passage is this, that all we need to do to receive the power of the Holy Spirit is to simply ask the Lord to give us that power. Ask the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us and the Holy Spirit will come upon us and he will give us that power uh, to uh, be more than conquerors in Christ. The other thing that we need to understand is this. The Lord himself is more interested in us living a life that pleases him than we could ever be. And we're not in the struggle alone. You know, I love what Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 tells us. It says, in the same way, the Spirit himself helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we ought to pray. But the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is as he intercedes for us according to the will of God. I love that because it tells me that the Holy Spirit himself is interceding and praying for me. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4, we are told, We do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but one who has been tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. I love that because it tells me that Jesus himself is that high priest. Jesus himself is the one who's interceding for us and, uh, and again, making uh, the Christian life possible within our lives. So if it's the Father's will that we be conformed to the image of Christ in our character, not falling back into sin, if it's the Spirit's ministry to intercede and pray for us and empower us so that we don't have to live a life of sin, if Jesus, according to Romans chapter 8 and verse 33, is seated at the right hand of God who will also make intercession for us, 
Well, then, those who are for us, as the old saying goes, are more than those who are against us. So what a wonderful thing it is to know that we can avail ourselves of those resources and realize that simply by asking in faith, we can, in fact, uh, uh, live as more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Great question. We sure appreciate it. you sending it along to us here on this edition of A Reason for Hope. Another interesting uh, question uh, that, that comes along uh, it comes to us from Aaron. Aaron asks, uh, at work, I'm having difficult with my Protestant work ethic and being a good witness. I think I come across as demanding and more personally, I fear my heart idolizes performance over living in grace. Any advice? Well, uh, I think there's some great advice that we find, uh, as far as this issue is concerned in the scripture, Aaron. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting, uh, how, uh, the scripture talks about uh, great insight into uh, workplace behavior. It's usually presented to us in the Bible in terms of how the Lord wants to deal with bond servants and masters back during that time. But if you're in any kind of circumstance where somebody else is paying the bills and someone else is giving the orders and you're subsidiary your role, uh, these things definitely apply. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 22 says this, bond servants Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto man, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Boy, if whatever workplace we go into, Aaron, uh, we realize that we are serving the Lord. We're serving the Lord Christ, that he's the one uh, that is in charge uh, of us, that uh, we're not working for earthly bosses, we're looking, working for him. And we realize that as we work for him, as we walk in faith, doing whatever our hand finds to do in a way that is pleasing to God, uh, there's going to be an eternal reward for all of that. That's going to make us awesome employees. We're not going to serve with eye service, as the scripture says. In other words, uh, we're not going to be one person when the boss is uh, on the floor and another person when the boss is off the floor. That's That makes us great employees. But notice it goes on, Aaron, and it talks about supervisors here. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 1, we read this, Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing you also have a master in heaven. Now, uh, no matter where you are in, in a, uh, a uh, economic structure, in a business uh, format, you're going to find that uh, sooner or later you've got a boss. Even if you're the CEO, you're responsible to shareholders and, and so on. Uh, a great CEO uh, realizes that uh, they want to make decisions because there's all kinds of people and families depending on him for their livelihood. So in a sense, he serves them. And so round and round it goes. But notice something. It's the same principle. We are to be just and fair. In other words, we're gonna, we are to stand for what's right on the workplace. We're not to look the other way and, and allow the boss over us uh, to suffer because, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm very gracious as, as a Christian. You know, a, a friend of mine uh, who has been involved in the past in uh, giving uh, opportunities to work to uh, an awful lot of uh, people down through time. Uh, approached uh, an individual about uh, helping a, a uh, person uh, looking for a job. And uh, the person declined and said, you know, uh, the, the problem that I run into is too many Christians that I hire think they're saved by grace and that they're employed by grace as well. Sometimes they're the worst employees that I've got. So, you know, we want to do what's just. You know, if it means lighting a fire under somebody, exhorting somebody, then, then we want to do that. But notice it's to be tempered by being just and fair. You know, it kind of goes back, Aaron, to uh, what uh, the Gospel of John says uh, about our Lord Jesus Christ. We beheld him, uh, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I love that about Jesus because he was full of grace and he was full of truth at the same time. He had that, that balance in life. So, Aaron, if you find yourself in a supervisory role. On the one side of the coin, you want to be full of grace because you've got a master who's going to ultimately reward you. And you want to give an account before him someday that you lived your life and occupied even your work life in a way that represented him. But you also want to uh, be working in truth, not looking the other way when we see things that are being done that are 
you know, immoral or unethical or even illegal. We want to make sure that we have that balance in our walk with God. So I think if you keep those things in focus, Aaron, uh, you're going to be a great boss. Just uh, apply the famous golden rule. Uh, be the kind of boss to your employees that you would want your boss to be if the roles were reversed. I think you're going to be just fine. Thank you so much uh, for that great question. Uh, you know, again, uh, another uh, interesting question here that does come up from time to time it comes from Roger. Roger, thank you for sending the question along. Uh, how old is the creation? Well, uh, there's a couple of different ways that we can answer that. Science will tell you that uh, according to their estimates, uh, the universe that we live in is anywhere from four and a half to six billion years old. And uh, they will trot out things like radiometric dating and the distance of starlight uh, to Earth to uh, try to uh, back up their assertion. A Christian, on the other hand, uh, takes a look in, uh, at uh, what the scripture has to say. And uh, the straightforward reading of the book of Genesis tells us something. Genesis doesn't tell us, you know, for instance, uh, the uh, earth was created on June 4th, uh, the year, uh, you know, uh, 4004 BC. But it does give us a way of being able to reason out how old the earth is. You know, in the book of Genesis, we see, for instance, that uh, the earth and everything that was in it, uh, the universe itself, and all that God created happened in six solar days. Genesis chapter 1 is emphatic about that. He uses the Hebrew word yom, which means days, but when that word days is used with an ordinal, like uh, the first or the second or the third, in virtually every other instance, we find it referring to a literal 24-hour solar day. God certainly could have created everything in the heavens and the earth in 24-hour uh, literal solar days. Uh, that's certainly not beyond him, and that's what the Bible purports to tell us. On top of this, we have genealogies. We run into the first ones in uh, Genesis chapters 4 and 5, and by adding together the years of the generations that are uh, located there, and then uh, going on to uh, Genesis chapter 11, uh, the table of the nations that we find there after Babel, uh, we can uh, put these figures together along with uh, some of the genealogies that we find in the book of First Chronicles, for instance, going all the way back to that time, and come to a conclusion that uh, according to a biblical framework, uh, the universe is no, long, no more than anywhere from 6 to 10,000 10, years old, I should say, at the very outside. The question that comes up for us is whose take on these things are we going to believe? Are we going to believe science or are we going to believe the scripture? Well, you know, some people say, well, hasn't science proven that through radiometric dating? Well, Roger, uh, radiometric dating isn't as open and shut as uh, we'd like to think. Some people say, well, haven't, hasn't the universe been carbon dated uh, to uh, billions of years old just even here on Earth? Well, carbon dating, uh, for instance, can only tell you how old things are to roughly about 10,000 years or so just because of the nature of the elements there. Other forms of radiometric dating understand this, uh, determine, attempt to determine age by measuring the amount of radioactive decay uh, by the presence of daughter elements in certain uh, minerals that we find. You know, for instance, uranium tends to decay into lead over time. So if you measure the amount of active uranium versus the amount of lead in a particular sample, uh, you can, by using math, calculate how old a particular sample is because of this process that's in view there. But wait a minute, there's a huge amount of assumptions that go into all of that. When someone says, well, we're going to use uranium uh, dating to figure out how old this sample is, first of all, they make an assumption about how much uh, of the radioactive element was in the sample to begin with. Secondly, they make another assumption that that amount of decay hasn't been affected by outside instances. For instance, exposure to ozone in the atmosphere can affect that. Exposure to other radioactive elements can affect the, the amount of decay that we see there. Uh, all these things are still up in the air. They just make the assumption that this element was pristine and this is going on. Even the rate of decay, we don't know if the rate of decay has been constant over time. So there's some massive assumptions that are involved with radiometric dating. You have to make a leap of faith to believe it 
Why? Because we weren't there to see if the world is really that old or not. But wait a minute, you might be saying, uh, how is that different than what you're purporting? Aren't you making a leap of faith because you weren't there as well? Yeah, well, I'll be the first one to admit it. Uh, I'm biased and you're biased. The, the, the question is, what is our bias all about? I'll put my cards on the table. Here's why I believe in a young earth. Because Jesus believed in a young earth. Uh, for instance, uh, when Jesus was discussing uh, the subject of marriage, in the book of Mark chapter 10, Jesus said this, Have you not read that from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female? Now notice something. This inverts the traditional evolutionary viewpoint and turns it on its head. Uh, even if you're going to try to buy into theistic evolution or progressive creationism and say, well, you know, we can believe in evolution and then uh, throw uh, that into uh, the, the uh, end of things there. Uh, the fact of the matter is Jesus said that from the beginning of creation, that is from the get-go, man was created in God's image and likeness. So, uh, you know, again, Jesus talked about Noah and the flood, Adam and Eve, uh, as actual events that took place in history. And here's why I tend to believe Jesus. Because he lived a perfect, sinless life. He died on a cruel Roman cross in a moment of history and rose from the dead. Now, no disrespect intended, but Carl Sagan, who said the cosmos is all that was, is, or ever will be, uh, he's a moldering in the grave right now. But Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be the creator of all things. And he gave the ultimate credential to be taken seriously. That's why I believe in a young creation. So, uh, again, uh, I hope that helps you out, Roger. Uh, and uh, it's a, obviously, we can get more involved uh, with that question. If you'd like to follow up, we'll be happy to follow up with you on the broadcast. Hey, following up on uh, Steve's uh, question, Steve's question is this. What's the difference between a living, the living soul and the new heart and the new spirit. Well, Steve, uh, I'll uh, I'll do my best to uh, take a shot at this. I, I hope I'm on target with what your question is asking. Uh, the phrase "living soul" goes back to uh, what we see in the creation account uh, in the book of Genesis, chapter two. We are told that God formed man out of the dust of the earth, and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. The the phrase "living soul" there is the Hebrew word nefesh. It's the idea of the life principle, the life force, that which animates an individual. And so because of that, because all human beings have that spark of life from God, becoming a living soul, uh, that's really what's being referred to here, that animating life principle. Science can't really put their finger on it. We don't know why things are living, why certain chemicals come together and suddenly they become alive and so forth. But this idea of the life principle is what's in view there. Uh, the idea of the new heart and the new spirit is this. Even though all human beings have this life principle within them, otherwise our hearts wouldn't beat and we couldn't breathe and we, couldn't, we wouldn't be animate, uh, the Bible does tell us that God told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden that uh, they were not to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day they ate of it, dying, they would die. In other words, there was going to be not only an emphasis from God on this point of view, but a very important insight. Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, as we know, and they didn't die on the spot, but they began the dying process, if you will. Even though they still had that nephesh, that, that breath of life from God in them, that allowed them to continue to live, uh, the death principle started to take over. Instead of living forever, instead of living uh, without uh, all the defects and imperfections and pains and aches that we go through in this life, uh, well, the death principle started to kick in. And so we see in the genealogy uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 5, uh, Adam uh, lived to be 900 plus years old and he died and, and, and so on. It's reiterated over and over and over again and he died. So physically, even though that nephesh continues, it's been affected by the fall. However, in the book of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel speaks about giving people a new heart and a new spirit, taking out the heart of stone, Jeremiah said, and giving them a heart of flesh, it's talking about coming to the second part of that dying you shall die e equation there because man not only died started to die physically there we died spiritually how do we know 
because the first thing that Adam and Eve, Eve did when they hightailed it off the garden was they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid themselves in the bushes from God. And uh, so the alienation from the one who is life uh, took place at that particular time. And, and so dying, we died. And so we need a new birth. That's why Jesus said, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom uh, of God. To as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Jesus said, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink, for out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. When we receive Christ, the Lord takes up his residence within our heart through the Holy Spirit. That is that new heart and new spirit that God gives to us. We're born again. God gives us a new form, if you will, beyond just the nephesh, the physical life principle. We are made alive spiritually in our walk with God. And so that's the distinction there. Uh, that living soul uh, that, uh, that Adam became, that nephesh in Hebrew, that life principle, everybody gets. And it's a limited uh, resource because the minute you are born, you start dying. You start the decay process, if you will. And some of us are farther along on that journey than others. Uh, but when we become born again, uh, the Bible says that the one who believes in Jesus shall not die, but is passed from death into life. The minute we became born again in our spirit, God gave us that everlasting life that uh, the Bible promises us. Now, what about people who die without Christ? Well, they'll live forever, but apart from the everlasting life, that God gives to us. Jesus defined eternal life in John chapter 17 and verse 3. This is eternal life. They may know you, the true and living God, and Jesus Christ, the one whom you've sent. If you reject a living relationship with God, you're going to live forever, but in a sense, you're going to be dying forever. That same death and decay principle is going to be kicking in and uh, ruling over you uh, for as long as you shall live because none of the blessings and benefits of eternal life knowing God will be yours from that time onward Steve I, I hope that answers your question sorry we're late at getting at it but uh, better late than never hopefully in terms of answering that question hey thanks so much for being with us on this edition of a reason for hope if you're blessed by the broadcast let somebody else know about it so that they can be a part of our comment corner as well thank you all for the great questions you passed along uh we are really looking forward to getting together with you again uh in our next uh, edition to answer your question on god's inspired word scott richard's wishing you a great rest of your day in the lord be in the word of the lord and may the word of the lord be in you you've been listening to a reason for hope Thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. Until we meet again, we would love to connect with you. You can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.